Hi, everyone. Let me set up my introduction. Welcome. My name is Andrea Bogart. I'm the manager of Lawrence Technological University's Detroit Center for Design and Technology and the founder of Embrace Creatives. I'm thrilled you can attend our second live stream event for Yeah, What Lester Said, an exhibit and panel on sustainability and design. Lester Brown has been called one of the great pioneer environmentalists and one of Marquis' who's who, 50 great Americans. Earning his master's degree in architectural agricultural economics from the University of Maryland in 1959, he went on to pioneer the concept of sustainable development. Climate change is no longer an abstract idea that might happen in the distant future. It's upon us now, and its effects can be felt via enormous storms, serious drought, and massive flooding here in the Midwest. By 2100, rising oceans are estimated to force as many as 2 billion residents of coastal areas worldwide to migrate towards higher ground, and agriculture yields in huge swaths of the Midwest will decline by 50% or more if we don't cut emissions. Collaborating with the American Institute of Architects Michigan, 2030 District, the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, community leaders, activists, green infrastructure experts, and architects, Lawrence Technological University's Detroit Center for Design and Technology and their curatorial partner Embrace Creatives are bringing this absolutely necessary conversation to the forefront before it's too late. The DCDT has put together two and a half months of programming along with an art exhibit, which is currently live on our website, Detroit.design backslash Lester. I've actually added the link to our Facebook comment section, so please visit our page, sign up for all of the programs that interest you, and enter the art gallery and view the architectural board exhibit. Everything is free and open to the public. Today's important program, we will dive deep into two newly designed 2019 built green infrastructure, stormwater infrastructure projects in Detroit, Michigan. These projects include the Sacred Heart Church, parking renovation, and the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History's Sankofa Permeable Pavers Project. In this panel, we will compare and contrast learnings for how these practices are informed by triple bottom line benefits for many stakeholders. Lessons learned and the nuts and bolts, funding, designing, implementing, maintaining, and the various returns on investment that are gained from building and shifting organizations towards greener infrastructure. Because we are live on Facebook, you have the ability to ask questions and comment. To participate, to participate, please type in the comments below the live stream. The speakers will see them and respond at the end of the presentation. You will be receiving their contact information to reach out after the event if you're interested in speaking to anyone directly. It's time to begin, so I'd like to introduce you to Jody Rains. Jody is the Executive Vice President of Programs at the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation. Jody started as the Vice President of Programs at the Erb Family, Family Foundation upon its creation in 2008. Previously, Jody worked at the Jewish Fund and the Skillman Foundation. A graduate of the Wayne State University Law School, she has practiced nonprofit and corporate law in Detroit. Recognized in 2007 by Crane's Detroit Business as one of Metro Detroit's most influential women, Jody currently serves on the Isaac Agri Downtown Synagogue Board, Live Six Advisory Board, Building the Engine of Community Development in Detroit Steering Committee, Urban Water, Water Funder Steering Committee, Detroit Sustainability Advisory Commission, and Detroit Stormwater Hub Advisory Committee. I will turn over the event to Jody now. She's one of our moderators, and I will see you all at the conclusion. Thanks, Andrea. Thank you for the introduction and for your hard work on this series, for, per, for putting together some really timely and provocative panels, and actually an absolutely stunning online art exhibit. If you haven't taken a look at it, I want to put another plug for that. And there is an artist talk, I believe, on July 16th. So you should tune back in for that. The purpose of today's panel, though, is um, really to demystify and encourage green stormwater infrastructure projects, and I'm going to start calling it GSI, in Detroit and the region. GSI is really still a new technology, but it's increasingly required by municipal codes and water utilities. And hopefully all of you creative out there have been getting business and are going to be getting more business in this area. We're going to be talking about the nuts and bolts 
and lessons from the field um, based on two projects that really went through a lot of work and worked through a lot of kinks. Hopefully you can learn from their lessons. The idea also is that it will help inspire you. Um, the logistics of today is um, that I will be co-moderating with Patrick Droz, and I'm going to be introducing some of the panelists throughout. I'll start with introducing Patrick, who will be moderating later on when we get to the Q&A. Um, Patrick Droz is a licensed professional engineer and principal with OHM Advisors Detroit office. Patrick works with OHM's Municipal Engineering Department, where he oversees the development and construction of public infrastructure projects in Southeast Michigan. He also assists in the construction of public infra, he also assists Detroit's water and sewerage department with the management of a green infrastructure site assessment program for non-residential property owners within the city. Through this project, his team has met with over 220 properties since 2017 and developed conceptual, conceptual solutions to help manage stormwater in accordance with DWSD's drainage charge credit program. He will step in to moderate the second half. Um, there will be uh, two presentations first, then we're gonna have a facilitate discussion that Patrick will facilitate, and then we're gonna open it up to questions and answers for all of you who are listening. So please type in the questions in the chat as we go, as they come to mind, but we're gonna hold all those questions off and address them as part of the Q&A at the end. We're waiting for the slideshow to start, um, but I think I'll continue. Um, okay, so I'm going to be introducing the panelists um, shortly. I want to first tell you, um, I introduced Patrick. Yeah, okay, we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so we thought the best way to demystify and showcase the incredible potential of GSI is to use two excellent case studies from Detroit. The first is the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History Sankofa Project, which are pervious pavers laid out in a popular African motif, envisioned by the museum with design and engineering by the ECT firm. And the second project you're gonna hear about is Sacred Heart Church. This is Detroit's largest parking lot project to date, facilitated by the Nature Conservancy with design and engineering by the Smith Group. The Charles Wright Project is gonna be presented by the Visionary Director of Sustainability, Leslie Tom. Leslie is the Chief Sustainability Officer at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History in Detroit. She came to this position by way of Wayne State University's Detroit Revitalization Fellowship in 2015. Leslie's work combines technical aspects of architecture with the museum visitor and staff experience, embedding African American stories of energy, water, waste and climate change into the museum systems. She focuses on the future of Green Museum's community engagement, service design, and behavior change. In 2019, she led both the Wright Museum and Michigan Science Center to win the American Alliance of Museums Sustainability Excellence Award. I also want to thank Leslie for, she's really the one who organized this panel and put an incredible amount of work into it. So thank you, Leslie. After Leslie, the Sacred Heart Project will be presented by Valerie Strasberg, the Nature Conservancy's Urban Conservation Program Director in Detroit. The first one to hold this job for a TNC, Valerie works closely with the City of Detroit and partners to encourage stormwater management through natural and green infrastructure with the goal of increased biodiversity and terrestrial habitat and improved quality of life for residents. An engineer and an entrepreneur Valerie's previous positions include founder of RST Learning Studio in Ann Arbor, six years on Ann Arbor's Environmental Commission, including chairing its water committee, and executive director of Nature's Voice, Our Choice. Some of Val's career highlights include spearheading Ann Arbor's first ever Green Streets policy and co-developing a water energy calculator for the cities of Chicago, Denver, and James City in Virginia. Val also put a lot of work into helping Leslie organize this panel. So we thank Val for that. Um, next slide. Uh, next slide, okay. So um, before we dive into the projects, I just wanna set the stage to get you into the right frame of mind to hear these stories and think about these projects. All of us on the panel that you're gonna hear from today are diehard believers in the triple bottom line. And as you can see on the slide, you probably are all aware of this, I hope, 
but the idea of triple bottom line is that it really balances social, economic, and environmental concerns. We need all three um, to really have a sustainable future. While GSI is definitely about managing stormwater for water quality purposes and to prevent flooding, equally important functions include community and economic development and public health and well-being. It adds beauty, curbs urban heat island effect, it brings nature back into the city. These elements all affect design and the process of design. As with all good design, deeply engaging people in the design process is critical, and you're going to hear a lot about that um, from these presenters. So this means not only what flowers they want to see and what plants, but what they value. A thoughtful design process often helps a community answer questions beyond the project. It helps them to think deeply about who they are as a community and who they would like to be. Next slide. And um, next slide. And while today we'll be focusing on highly designed and engineered projects, I just don't want you to forget that in some cases, smaller scale GSI can be done at a very community-based DIY level. Here's one of my favorites in Detroit, uh, a series of rain gardens at St. Suzanne Cody Rouge Community Resource Center in Detroit. These gardens were designed and installed with the help of a community-based Detroit program called Rain Gardens to the Rescue, which now has uh, helped install 60 residential rain gardens in Detroit and is helping create a growing green culture shift in the city. Next slide. More examples of projects in Detroit can be found at the new DetroitStormwater.org. This is a great new website. A regional website is in the works, but this website is a public-private partnership with Detroit Water and Sewage Department and numerous organizations, including many of the speakers on today's panel. What I think, I encourage you to visit the website. I think what you all will like best about this site is it's in a way kind of an open source site and that it is what we make it. There is a link on that website for you to submit your projects. They have to be projects in Detroit and um, also resources. So it's a great way to market, <laughs> market yourself by submitting some great resources to this website. So with that framing, I'm gonna now turn it over to Leslie and Val, and then I'll be back after that to introduce our final two speakers for the discussion portion of the program. Leslie. Leslie, you're on mute. Jake. Thank you, Jody. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Leslie Tom, and I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, affectionately known as the Wright. I'm happy to share our work with you to get into the nuts and bolts of doing museum sustainability um, of energy, water, and waste, this time on water management. It's been a real journey since 2015 to learn to hold the space for community at the Wright Museum. Um, being new to Detroit and new to sustainability. But today I'm presenting the story of how we're engaging our communities to build green stormwater infrastructure in five acts, like a stage play. So I just wanna make sure that we're seeing the uh, presentation. <laughs> yes, great. Um, so act one, people and water are important. We are holding the space for people and water with the hope and vision that with each project, we will get better and better at continuously improving at collaboration, co-creating, empowering the community, the next generation and our partners. This means we are doing what museums do well, create space for curiosity, conversations, to reflect on culture, discuss issues and strive for walking the talk in energy, water and waste. And speaking of museums, there are over 35,000 museums in the United States, which is more than Starbucks and McDonald's combined since there are more voices hold power, we held over 16 conversations on water with elders, youth, Detroiter, Detroiters, artists, activists, historians, and museum staff. Grounded in these conversations from Detroit, a city that is 85% black, this is a story of how a museum is trying to be a conduit for listening and trying to practice how true transformation, not just transactions, connect people to stories which remind us of connecting our connections to water, soil, or native plants. But let's not design or build any rain garden, bioswale, det uh, detention basin, or other green stormwater infrastructure practice. Let's find the opportunity to uplift a story, a memory, a learning, to exemplify our actions in respect for history and place. From this work, we heard loud and clear that the Black community has a deep connection to water. 
we learn that there is an abundance of knowledge and experiences with water, a duality, both positive, negative, violent, cultural, political, and spiritual. This work acknowledges the sacred connection between African-American history, African traditions, and a culture tied to our natural environment. There is a sacred trust of water and water is a human right. A quick shout out to water warriors in Michigan like Monica Lewis Patrick from We the People or Marley Little Miss Flint Cop Copany, the 12 year old water activist from Flint, Michigan. Um, sacred because we trust water for growing, connecting, cleaning, memories, motherhood, rituals, and our bodies are all made up of 60% of water. So this is the framing of our infrastructure as message. There is an image here of our completed permeable pavers project completed eight months ago. A museum staff member showed me when entering our museum next to our theater, there is a door and a shield with West African Jinkra symbols. Collectively, we chose the Sankofa symbol, which represents a bird, the only animal that can turn its heads backwards to look back to history before it moves forward. This is an example of combining history, culture, art, and sustainable design. We worked with our elders to cite the bird so that its head is looking to the museum, indicating learning starts here. So act two, um, we are trying to solve several problems with our infrastructure projects. Problem one, we have forgotten our natural systems. This is an image of a beaver, the quintessential ecosystems engineer. Beavers dam up rivers and help to create wetlands, which naturally slow down and retain and detain the water. Our country has a violent history to overpower and control nature. And in the 1700s and 1800s, these beavers were hunted almost to extinction for their prized coats. As beaver populations and old growth forests decreased and the urbanization of our built environment increased, this is why we live in a city with impervious surfaces. Problem two, managing water. We need to manage water better in the city. Our water is not retained or detained well, and this overwhelms our combined sewer overflow systems, spilling sewage into the Detroit River. This is a slide from the 2014 floods in Detroit. It shut down Detroit's freeways, flooded homes, brought in FEMA, and was the impetus for our City of Detroit Sustainability Office. We want to collectively bring attention to managing our water and connecting this issue to issues of health, especially as over 141,000 households have been disconnected from water. So in 2017, when we realized our D Detroit Water and Sewage Department's drainage fee would be over $19,000 for our 2.45 impervious acres, we decided to make this an opportunity to manage our water, combine art, culture, and history. Uh, problem three, making assumptions. So um, it's, it, we have to take time to not make assumptions. The, when we first started this project in March of 2017, we assumed green stormwater infrastructure would be fun, but something didn't feel right. And this is when we reached out to community champions to help lift this project to where it is now. How can talking about stormwater and extreme weather be fun? How can the largest African-American museum at the time ignore violent aspects of water in terms of accessibility, privatization, climate change, black mold, polluted and edible fish, all while ignoring the Rouge River watershed and the Great Lakes? Instead, our opportunity to bring the mission of the museum and make this work to, be, to build community. Act three, community connections. As a learning institution, we are on a journey to co-create frameworks to connect stories, memories, and experiences of water to our museum visitors. It is our mission and charge as a history and learning institution to highlight the past, present, and future stories about water. We are using that lens of duality, which I alluded to before. We are creating a conversation space to have water histories juxtaposed upon life-sustaining inno innovations, all while bringing attention that clean water saves lives, hashtag. Um, especially in this time of COVID. So um, our museum departments started to use our green stormwater infrastructure to redesign how we are starting to do things internally. Um, during With a Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation grant, we were able to show 500 plus elementary and middle school Camp African children, a real live garden planted um, by, by children where these children could be able to build their own black eyed peas from Keep Growing Detroit. Um, also last year, World Water Day fell on a Friday and over a thousand people came to learn about water justice or simply watch water droplets dance. 
Um, the Wright Museum and the Michigan Science Center worked with two local educators, Naeem Edwards from Michigan State University and Antonio Cosme from the Wildlife National Wildlife Federation to tell and teach uh, a history grounded in African Center teachings that opened my eyes as well as these lucky middle schoolers to spend six weeks learning about water issues, deforestation, and soil. As a result, these children developed a story on how the beavers lived below between the Wright Museum and the Michigan Science Center. And once they learned their history from these fictional exhibits, they came out and showed us how to all build natural systems. So we use our museums to uplift community education experiences by painting rain barrels with local artists and by being able to reimagine how to engage our public. Act four, so what? So since I know in our audience, we have a number of architects and engineers and building owners, um, I want to go on a little bit on the other co-benefits from a technical level um, that was added to this work. Um, so we were able with the Ur grant from the Herb Family Foundation to be able to create a green initiatives phase one plan. It captures many of the African African American water stories we heard across our landscape. We laid out paths, native plants, storytelling platforms, solar arrays, future exhibition space, tree plantings, etc. This fits in and, for, and informs a larger, dis, larger district wide Detroit square plans where we can work with our, our neighbors uh, in the cultural center to look at cross institutional water plan management. Um, another opportunity that we were able to, to do was to be able to uh, get feedback on our guiding principles. So as we heard from these community meetings, there were themes that started to emerge and we held a green museum town hall to distill what we heard. We, it was facilitated by two black Detroit urban planners, Clorinda and her husband, Richie Harrison, who by the way, was one of the babies Dr. Wright, our founder delivered. One of these principles, what some of these principles are one earth, one water, deep in relationships, don't knock in, don't knock, come in. We cannot go at this alone. And these principles are starting to inform how all of our, our uh, programs at the museums are starting to emerge. Act five, the nuts and bolts of what we're actually doing from a technical perspective. So I'm happy to report that our board of trustees are supporting us to build our third green stormwater infrastructure project this summer. Stay tuned because building our green building infrastructure is the right thing to do on any site. The Wright Museum's intentional engagement pays homage to the legacy of our founder, Dr. Charles H. Wright. It acknowledges the sacred connection between African-American history, culture, and the environment. With this framing, we invited the community to map different relationships to water. We captured water stories using computing power to help us capture and organize this data through transcripts and recordings. We worked with Wayne State University's T. Rust PhD student to, of anthropology to be able to help us create themes and uh, understand opportunities to oper operationalize listening. We signed up to receive a free green stormwater infrastructure engineering report from the city of Detroit's water and sewage department. We ran through several practices, cost estimates, return on investments, and we were able to use the funds from the Herb Family Foundation and Wilson, Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation to match a newly released capital partnership program, all listed on the city's websites. In any traditional design and construction project, there are various phases to move the project along. However, we do want to be responsible for empowering people, voices, learning, stories to create beloved spaces. We are lucky to have so much support to support to showcase green stormwater infrastructure in this very public way at the museum. I hope we dig into what this diagram shows, that there needs to be a champion to work together to bring community voices together to organize all the information and provide to, to provide to our design consultants. And when there is a team to really help hold the space to let the magic happen, we can collectively add a layer of making the vision of connecting past, and in this case, African traditions to teach us possibilities for a good future. Our current CEO, Neil Barclay, who founded and fundraised and conceptualized the August C. Wilson Center in Pittsburgh, created a LEED certified building. So he understands the importance of energy, water, and waste. 
we are starting from to form the foundations and team to lead and operationalize the intentions to create a multidisciplinary collaboration and true feedback loops to hold space, which is what Dr. Wright intended this museum to be. From a technical perspective, these are details of our permeable pavers. Since there is an existing invert under our worn circle drop-off, we did little to change the infrastructure. Since the concrete was spalding, it was becoming a trip hazard. We had two contractors work together so that the concrete would shed into our permeable pavers. I hope Patrick Judd, our landscape architect from ECT, will speak a little bit more about the innovations of working with our paver manufacturers to ensure cost effective means and methods to construct two tones of pavers for less than 5,000 square feet of construction. Um, our green stormwater infrastructure is a collection of many of our green projects. We are wanting to make the invisible visible with technical, social, and cult cultural framings. We wanna provide black and green experiences to pique everyone's interest in, welcoming, in a welcoming way. And we wanna prepare all work to inspire the next generation of black and green environmentalists. So in ending this presentation, I'm sharing one of the takeaways from our many community conversations. Tom Stevens' daughter, Julia Cunio, designed the graphics for this quote from Maud Barlow, Council of Canadians. If we pay attention to what's really happening with our water and deal with it appropriately, it will show us how to solve all other problems. I hope this resonates with everyone listening um, because in this, the picture in this slide shows, why are we watering our lawns with potable water? Why, why do we even have lawns? Why are we not using um, native plants that are more appropriate to our place? Let's make spaces and let's make the right museum a place to challenge and dismantle racist logic, myself included, to build platforms for the next generation to think differently about what we value in our history. On our last note, water is continuously teaching us and respecting, having us to respect the past, respect all those before us, and when we follow water, these lessons of ripples gently welcome others to put mother nature and our relationships first. Thank you. And so Val is up next. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. Um, Leslie, that was beautiful and I, I just want to say thank you for that articulate, passionate delivery of, of a really important message. I'm a little nervous now to even go after that. I mean, I just thank you. Um, so hello, everyone. I'm Valerie Strasberg. Um, I direct our city's work in Detroit. Um, and in following, I think Leslie really touched on so many of the drivers that um, propel a lot of, of the work that we're doing in the city and speak to a lot of the truths of the significance of water and the history of water as it stands with the, the African-American and the African community historically. Um, I'm really excited today to kind of share a little bit more about our project at Sacred Heart Church. But before um, we launch into the nuts and bolts of that project, I want to give you a little bit more background um, and, and frame the context uh, and setting for this project. So um, with that, I'll ask Andrea to go ahead and share my presentation here. Thank you. So um, for those of you who are joining today and not in Detroit, I want to pull back and give a little more geographic context for where Sacred Heart sits in the, in the footprint of Detroit. Sacred Heart is in the greater, it's in the greater Eastern Market area. It's actually a part of Eastern Market's core footprint. And uh, Eastern Market is located very close to the city center of Detroit. So the star here represents the, the geography of the Greater Eastern Market. And part of Eastern Market is this historic uh, market core. Now, Eastern Market is, um, has been, sorry, has been a um, wholesale uh, public food market 
for the last over more than a century. It provides um, wholesale produce and um, also has about 125 food processing businesses that um, have, many of them have originated for the, the entirety of the market's existence. So those 125 food businesses actually provide um, about 1,500 jobs, uh, many of which are food-related jobs that provide um, business, or I'm sorry, employment opportunities for Detroiters. This is the second highest employment district in the city of Detroit outside of downtown and midtown. Um, so with 2 million visitors annually and a great deal of pressure right now that's happening because as the redevelopment that downtown and midtown are seeing, um, those that redevelopment pressure is starting to radiate beyond just those areas and moving into the core market. And as it moves into the core market, it's driving rents up uh, as well as real estate prices, which are forcing a lot of these historic businesses to make choices about whether they can really afford to invest in upgrades in their facilities. So um, what that means is they might very well leave the area. So if they leave the area, that would take those jobs with them. So adjacent to the core market is this area called the Greater Eastern Market. And the Greater Eastern Market is a neighborhood that actually had some of the first demolitions in the city back 25 years ago. And since that time, um, a lot of the area has sat vacant. And so as the Eastern Market uh, Partnership, which is a nonprofit, has been working and managing a lot of the, the sheds that provide the um, spaces for 600 vendors that come to the public market weekly, year round. Um, so as they've been helping support the, the core market, there's also an opportunity to support these 125 businesses who many of them are feeling the pressure of having to relocate in order to actually expand and move the food processing into this greater eastern market area. But with that comes some challenges because this is a historic neighborhood. And while there's a lot of vacancy, there's also still a lot of residents that live in this area. Um, and so this framework plan that the city here, you can see the four uh, logos here on my screen, the Nature Conservancy, Eastern Market Partnership, the uh, Detroit Economic Growth Corporation and the city of Detroit via the planning department and the Detroit Water and Sewerage Department, all um, together developed a framework plan for the greater Eastern market area. And this framework plan is actually one of more than a dozen that the city has done for different neighborhoods within uh, Detroit. But the framework plan in this case, the Nature Conservancy said, hey, you know, this is a great opportunity to actually integrate um, green and nature into an economic redevelopment plan. And as you can see, my screen just showed Sacred Heart Church here that just popped up. And so I just want to give you some geography. The, the project we're going to talk about in a minute, Sacred Heart Church, is actually located here on the core market. So the significance of sharing this framework plan and this backstory is because um, because really we chose to work with Sacred Heart because of its proximity to this work that we had started in 2017 with the city and with the Eastern Market Partnership. So this plan itself was looking at um, these goals that I showed on this past slide. It was really about preserving those 1500 jobs, but then also allowing for an additional um, an additional expansion of those jobs that the food industries can bring. And many of them are actually living wage jobs that um, do not require a, a secondary degree or a college education. So this is a really big deal. And they are projecting another potentially 2,000 jobs that could become um, available over the course of build out of this area in the gem. So what the Nature Conservancy said was, hey, if you're going to do this economic redevelopment, what about thinking 
um, about nature at the outset of this design. So not just putting you know, a plan in place for what kinds of food businesses, but as you're thinking about infrastructure and truck routes and mobility, how about we also think about the infrastructure for stormwater management and how we can use nature as part of that process. So what you see on the screen here is the layout that was created in order to, um, in order to think about how to really make this greater Eastern market a place that could be most inviting and maximizing the efficiency in the space and providing um, an area for those businesses that are going to be moving into this area. So the gray boxes you see here are all uh, the food businesses. And these green spaces are about 100 by 200 uh, foot um, greenways that would manage runoff from these uh, future developments in spaces like the one we see here. So this is a kind of a prototypical example of a streetscape where these greenways would actually provide landscape buffers as well as um, infrastructure, stormwater infrastructure as GSI. And so this is an example of kind of what we might see into the future. It could be as simple as potentially kind of gravel walking paths with, with um, trees and bioswales, or it could be as intricate as this walking bridge that you see on the right, um, that if you are familiar with the city of Detroit, uh, it would look, oops, sorry, it would look more like we see downtown in um, when we, we see Millican State Park. So, really what this framework plan did, so the Nature Conservancy came in and um, we helped support the stormwater management network plan chapter of this framework plan. And so the idea being, it sets a vision for integrating stormwater with the redevelopment. This is what that space in the greater Eastern market looks like today. And this is what we envision it looking like tomorrow. So, as you can see, these green uh, tree-lined spaces would actually be those greenways that I just shared a minute ago. Now, again, why is this important to Sacred Heart Church? Well, Sacred Heart is here on the core market, a stone's throw away from the greater eastern market area and where we're looking at this expansion. So, the idea of having a project where we would retro and use nature as infrastructure to not only set the stage for what could be in this, in this um, redevelopment area, but also to provide an opportunity for members of the church and clergy to actually champion for these kinds of projects um, as part of what they want the neighborhood to look like as the redevelopment starts to happen. So before I go into the nuts and bolts here, I actually want to go ahead and let Andrea share a video of the project that I think will speak volumes. Andrea? That's all right. When I walked in the door, right. it was a That's certain warmth, right. uh, a sense of belonging, right. acceptance, in love. Sit in the kingdom, that's all right, that's all right, that's all right. That's Sacred right. Heart has always been the mother that's church of the black Catholic community. Sacred Heart means a lot to the people of the city of Detroit. I mean, we have people coming from, yeah. coming from a long ways yeah. uh, to come to Sacred Heart. There's a certain magic here. The energy is just vibrant, I love it. It doesn't matter if you what color you are. We're all family here. We all support each other like it's our own. Community. That's what, that's what it's all about. Service is the name of the game around here. And it's putting words to practice now. Simply put, it's, uh, we call it the parking lot project. And it isn't just about a parking lot. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's going to be something that enhances this whole area. The earth is kind of like our own lives. We only live one life, and we only have one earth. So what we're introducing here to this community uh, is a process of finding ways to conserve the great gift of water that we've been given. It's a storm water conservation that takes the storm water and conserves it for the growing of plants and the watering of plants. 
so that the water isn't all going into the sewer system. And as a result of the conservancy being involved, we um, have had experts in almost every area. The minute that there is a big rain event, the pipe system, the sewer system, overflows into the Detroit and Rouge River. And that's where green infrastructure comes into play. We anticipate that this is going to keep about 1.5 million gallons out of the combined sewer system on an average year. So you're reducing the pressure on the pipes, reduced treatment at the plants, a reduced drainage charge for the church. But what's actually bigger than all of those things is the fact that Sacred Heart as a community can display and demonstrate what they want their city, their community, and their neighborhood to look like into the future. This will be a teaching moment, how we can be engaged, that we can start doing things, simple things on our own, that can have a great impact on our earth. Good for the church, good for the community, good for Detroit. It's something that uh, is going to be around for a while. I think I'll go ahead and go back to sharing my presentation here. Thank you. Um, so hopefully you all can see that, you know, we have this kind of expansive view. Now we're here at Sacred Heart Church and it's so much more than just a parking lot. And without understanding that bigger purview, you might not really see it because that, that framework plan that I was sharing, um, you know, that's a 15 year horizon. So when we started this at Sacred Heart and that became a reality and we had this opportunity to do this project and um, we had the, the funding from the Ralph C. Wilson Foundation to be able to, to put a green infrastructure project in, we were really excited. To, to dig in and then use these learnings from this project to actually inform the reality of what those greenways would cost into the future. So we had, um, we had six very explicit project goals that I'm sure we'll talk about more later, um, but here they are quickly. So the first was um, trying to reduce the drainage charge. For those of you who uh, are here in Detroit, you'll know that there is a very significant stormwater utility that is uh, costly, particularly for faith-based organizations, nonprofits, those entities that um, have a lot of parking lot, impervious, you know, hardscape, and uh, not a lot of revenue. So that was one of the big things. We wanted to make sure that the project was able to reduce that charge, maximize the reduction. We also, as the Nature Conservancy, wanted to make sure we were doing green infrastructure that incorporated the most nature possible. And so providing a variety of nature-based GSI practices that were beautiful, but could be maintained by the church, meaning we didn't want there to be 10 different native species, even as the Nature Conservancy, as we'll talk about later, and Andy can testify, you know, um, we are very concerned about biodiversity and diverse habitats, but in the city where um, native plants are not something that everyone puts in their front yard, as Leslie said, we wanted to make sure that it wasn't something that was challenging over time to maintain. Um, and as I just mentioned, we wanted to document the lessons. We wanted to make sure that as we went along, we were able to really parse out what all of the challenges and opportunities were with this project that could translate to the individual 12 and a half acres of Greenway that we see the opportunity for over in the greater Eastern market. Um, you know, the, there are a lot of programs that have been launched in the past five years or so around um, incorporating nature, 
uh, and and uh, natural area management and native plant maintenance into landscape technician training programs. So that was also something we wanted to make sure we were doing. Um, wanted to make sure that the the church and the parishioners themselves, there are 3,000 parishioners at Sacred Heart Church. We wanted to make sure that those parishioners felt engaged and um and and felt ownership over this project and so making sure that along the way at every step we did lots of outreach and engagement and making sure that the voices and the desires between design and planting and long-term maintenance were all incorporated into um the values uh and and vision of the parish itself and then monitoring um, over time we really would like to go back and do some performance monitoring to make sure that we are actually um, comparing what the theoretical design volumes are to the actual managed volumes so this project took it started it was launched in 2017 um, just about a, a year or so after we uh, began work over with the framework plan. Um, and a lot of this was, the first year was around developing agreements with the archdiocese because the Nature Conservancy does not own the land. And that took, that, that was a process. So once we got that all settled, um, we started planning and design in 2018, and then we launched construction, uh, permitting construction, all of that in 2019. And uh, as of today, we are continuing. Uh, the, the project was completed in the fall of 2019, and we are sticking with Sacred Heart as the Nature Conservancy to continue supporting the maintenance for the first three years of the project. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more in detail later about the planning and design process but i want to just talk for a second about the the design concepts so um we have multiple designs and one of the big drivers of the the you know design concepts here was meeting those goals while also realizing that we had limited funds so we had we were really trying to make sure that we were um meeting the goals of maximizing the amount of green well, um, also maximizing the amount of drainage charge credit. So I'm just going to toggle for a second. You can see here we have these initial designs have a lot of at the bottom of your screen, you'll see there's a lot of pavement, so porous pavement, but pavement nonetheless. And so really wanting to make sure that we found ways as we did by the time we got to final design um, to incorporate more nature based solutions in. So the the trick for this was was um, meeting the confluence of these goals along with a targeted budget of no more at the time of spending $500,000 on construction. So we had a limited budget and that's what drove um, some of our decision making. Now, the design that I just showed you, the conceptual that this was actually some of the as built we basically uh, have two systems, both of which capture runoff from the rooftop and from the um, the actual surface area here of the parking lot and directs it into these bio swales essentially in there's kind of a, more of a planter style in the one area and a, a wider um deeper bioswale in the other area, but both of which um, have a pretty extensive engineered uh, storage system below ground. So looking at this, um, again, some of the some of the things now I'm going to dive into the nuts and bolts that we really had to do in, in figuring out how to land at that design was going back and forth around the goals and um, making sure that those goals were in line with the budget that we had. So as an example, we were we were kind of targeting this $4.50 per gallon managed mark in part because that's kind of the where we saw the um, national average for green infrastructure projects like this. And, um, and when we then looked at value engineering and saw that one of our, um, you know, one of the design elements was to put porous 
concrete uh, along the walkway. And that was gonna be $100,000 to do that. And when we looked at the drainage charge credit that we would get, it was only gonna give us a 1% credit back on the bill. So those were the kind of decisions that we made in order to go back and forth on how we actually did value engineering around this project. Um, suffice it to say, that was eliminated from the design and we do not have uh, porous concrete uh, walkways. So in general, um, here's some facts about the actual costs and projected savings. So once it was all built, we wound up with construction costs that were about 150,000 over what we were targeting. The cost per gallon managed, we have not finished. We're actually in the process of kind of calculating it, recalculating it. But I can tell you that it is very close to the unit rate that we were projecting. And um, we did manage to get a, actually it's 51, we just recalculated that it is a 51% green credit. So the church is seeing a 51% credit on their drainage charge or their stormwater utility, which is huge. It amounts to about a $7,800 savings annually. One thing I want to point out that is so important, and it's a learning that we are taking away and taking back to those greenways, is that as we were looking at the construction and those costs, a lot of those costs, if we were coupling this project, this retrofit project, alongside um, a new build, we would actually see potentially up to an 80% reduction in overall costs because so much of the, the costs are involved in moving dirt, doing asphalt, um, you know, repaving uh, and excavation and such. And when you couple that with already having to create a building footprint, the price of these kinds of, of projects goes way down. Um, we're going to get into this during the Q&A, but I'm just uh, giving some teasers about expecting the unexpected in your projects. So the 150000 now some of that um, was part of contingencies that are kind of, you know, they pop up during construction. Uh, some of that was because of just designs. The bids came up back higher than we anticipated. But... Um, here are some things where we had, you know, we had light poles that we had to protect and hadn't really thought about how we were going to do them. And it was something we had to deal with in, in the field. Um, there's, you know, we had to deal with uh, infrastructure that had been compromised in this uh, catch basin and these, uh, these air curb cuts that were just forgotten. Some painting, some asphalt that actually uh, we had to go back and repair because it was creating ponding. And um, I'm actually gonna fast forward through here to one of my favorites. So these are these are just some plantings that had to, to be removed and replanted and regraded because they were too steep. Um, but this this one here I think is is worth noting. So you can see on the far left that this wall actually peaks and yet there is a curb cut. So it's kind of bizarre because water is supposed to flow through that curb cut. Well, the reason that it peaks was just because of an oversight on um, some of the, the drawings were actually the elevations were miscommunicated. And um, ultimately it was all the way around miscommunications, contractor, designer. And so they, um, I think we went through a really good process, but we had to replace that section of the wall. And the stress of that was just that it came in the winter when uh, it was actually it was fall and we got an early snow. So here we had to put on blankets over the concrete and then it led to planting the plants later in the season. Um, so this is just a, this is a real nuts and bolts story that um, I'm happy to say that it all worked out very well and we were able to, uh, to recover and I'm going to flip here to the final project. So thankfully, once everything was installed, the temperature warmed up and we were able to get a really beautiful photo op the day that it was all completed. Um, like Leslie shared, we did, as I said, we went through, helped Sacred Heart Church um, with their drainage charge credit process. We helped them fill out the form, submit that, and we'll get into that, I think, in a little more detail later. 
Overall, I just want to share some of the magnificent benefits. So we've got 1.5 million gallons that are retained through this and over three and a half million detained. So we are managing a ton of runoff. We have now peeled back lots of pavement, introduced native plants, native habitat, and reducing the urban heat island effect. This has enormous community benefits. As I mentioned, there are 3,000 parishioners that are at this church. And this photo is beautiful because it really shows how this is more than a parking lot. This church is something that, uh, or this parking lot is something that is used um, annually as part of the church bazaar. And I was out there for the last two years uh, prior to, to this year. And it is hot. These tents and spending the day out there um, is really grueling. It's, it's beautiful, but there's a lot of community gathering that happens in this space. And so the thought that now what you see in the forefront or, or even in the background where the tents are will now be flanked by this, this greenery um, and have a lot of benefit beautification wise too. Um, so with that, I think we are ready to uh, to launch into the panel discussion. Thank you, everyone. Great. Those were two incredible presentations. Thank you, Val, so much, and Leslie, so much. Um, I am going to um, turn it over to um, Patrick Droz to um, to moderate a discussion with the designers and engineers on the projects, but I'm going to introduce them. I'm looking for their bios. Um, Patrick, I will introduce them for you. So Patrick's going to moderate um, a series of questions uh, with Patrick Judd and Andrew McDowell. And Patrick Judd uh, was the um, designer on the Charles Wright project. Patrick is the senior manager of ECT Ann Arbor's Green Infrastructure Studio. His experience includes site master planning and design, construction oversight of corporate and commercial sites, parks, trails, Native American lands, natural areas restoration, and sustainable farm planning. Central to his planning and design are ecological resiliency and green stormwater through the lens of climate change. Patrick's work demonstrates how land built sustainably can protect and restore healthy ecosystem functions, site design and development practices, and principles. By incorporating this philosophy, projects can respond to the needs of both the environment and people, improving the quality of life. Andrew McDowell is the, was the lead designer on the Sacred Heart Project. Andrew is a landscape architect at Smith Group. His vision is to drive sustainable design by expanding upon and breaking into new territories of urban ecological design. Andrew approaches projects through the lens, through a lens that focuses on reinforcing positive relationships and healing between people, wildlife, and natural processes. Over the past 11 years, Andrew has contributed to the successful completion of many projects oriented towards green infrastructure, ecological restoration, brownfield redevelopment and adaptive reuse. Andrew's experience has equipped him with tools and ideas to guide clients from planning to implementation. So we are really gonna drill down now into hearing from some experts about some of the nuts and bolts here. Patrick. Thanks, Jody. Um, I, I'd also like to point out that we'll have um, the opportunity for um, the owner side to comment as well. Uh, with Valerie and Leslie potentially asking, answering some of these questions as they come up. Um, I'd also offer to the group, um, for everyone uh, watching us online, that if you do have questions um, about the presentations we saw earlier, uh, or as we go through the question and answer um, portion here, and we're going to have six um, specific questions, but if you have a particular question that you'd like to ask any one of the people present, feel free to leave that comment um, through the uh, interface and we'll see those comments and we'll have time at the end here um, to, uh, to answer those. Um, and our event goes till about four o'clock. So uh, I think we're gonna spend about a half an hour here on our uh, question and answer um, that we've already kind of planned out a little bit, um, but then we'll have plenty of time at the end if there's other questions um, that come in and we'll be monitoring that throughout. 
Um, so our questions today are going to um, hit uh, kind of as the title of the program talks about on some of the nuts and bolts of green infrastructure or GSI. Um, but we're also going to get into some of the uh, what I'll call behind the scenes things that um, uh, everyone has to be aware of both on the owner side and on the designer side. Um, in a few of our presentations, we've talked about green infrastructure as a technology. Um, and that to you as designers should mean that it's something that's evolving a little bit. It's not totally set in stone, I guess pun intended. Um, it's not to the point where um, you can basically throw a standard detail on a plan sheet and know that it's going to get built the right way. Um, and that in many regards translates to risk. So we'll talk about that a little bit and how people are managing that. Jody mentioned how um, number of our uh, agencies in the area are starting to uh, make transition to make GSI part of the expectation. And uh, as uh, Valerie had mentioned, implementing GSI on new projects is a lot less expensive than it is on retrofitting old. Um, so that is certainly empowering as the design community goes in that direction. Um, but it's also something that should make it a point that we are really considering GSI as part of that initial discussion. It's not a value added, it's part of the design process. So with that, our first question is about design process. And so certainly um, in both presentations, we talked a lot about some of the exceptional work done um, on the community engagement and getting that part of it into the design process. But then I think from our perspective, uh, and, I, and I'm a, an engineer and, and consultant, I'm curious to know how, uh, how our designers took that information and brought that into the design and, and where were those opportunities where innovation were. So um, we'll start with Patrick Judd for that one, uh, if you could take that one. Thanks, Patrick. And um, it was a interesting process uh, on our part. Uh, we actually were brought in kind of midway through the through the uh, pro project, and so we had to kind of catch up on what was already accomplished and what is it that they wanted to do, and really understand firsthand what were the goals um, and what were the expectations uh, that the client was uh, looking for, as well as the community. And I think it was one of those things that with the design process is a lot of you are probably familiar with it's, you know, initial discovery, site analysis, uh, understanding the program, and then getting into uh, community or client input to start to massage and define what exactly the design is going to be. And then you get into the schematic, the concept design, schematic design, all the way through construction documents. So in this case, we were right at a point though that the construction documents had really um, had already been put together. But I think at the same time, there was something that uh, from learning from the community input, the goals and the first principles that were established is the green storm order infrastructure really didn't resonate well enough to the community based on what the information that was provided. And so, a lot of my uh, background and my um, philosophy has always been being able to take green stormwater infrastructure, specifically water, water is a resource, and how do you embrace it and how do you celebrate it? And in this instance, it was like, how do we incorporate art and design into the, the Warren Circle um, to be able to express that and to also express what is kind of an African-centric design? What are some of the African-centric stories and narratives that could be um, part of that definition and that understanding? And so it was a matter of digging back and going back a few steps with the community um, and some of the leaders to really understand a little bit more about what that story and what those narratives were. And so it was then uh, becoming evident that there was a lot of information that was out there. It's just a matter of being able to bring it forward, define it, and how do we integrate it into the design itself. Um, and as you can see, or if you weren't able to, there's a lot of this expression in stories and narratives throughout the campus in the master plan, in which case what we're looking at is all the different types of elements that could be integrated into that stormwater management. But again, we wanna be able to 
start to think about who is it communicating to because some of this is communicating to the engineers that are part of the audience or the artists that are part of the audience or some of the um, history buffs or some other faction, but being able to really express in those terms what is important to each individual who visits the museum and almost as if some of these exhibits that are inside the museum need to be expressed in the outdoors uh, throughout the campus. And so it was just a matter of being able to take um, some of that community information and then being able to, um, uh, again, like I said, step back a little before proceeding to the final uh, design that you see and installation of that project. Some of the innovations that we look at is, as I mentioned, not only the stories and narratives, but how do we incorporate biophilia principles into the overall design? And what I mean by that is how do we, um, it's something that Vale had touched on and that is nature-based design. So we really want to be able to express nature in a whole different way and bring that forward and integrate that into the daily uses um, of the campus that express what is nature and how is nature being connected to the people uh, that are the visitors of that and how do they um, bring about an emotion that is important um, that people can take away as they leave the museum with a whole different attitude and understanding and learning uh, from what water is and how important water is uh, to our daily lives. Thanks, Patrick. Great. Um, one of the things that, that Patrick talked about um, was some of the almost guiding principles and, and Valerie in her presentation um, had those specifically listed out too. Um, from your perspective, Andy, when you were entering design, um, how was that part of your process? And again, from innovation, um, where did that come through? And, and uh, you, you talked about how it sounds like that was one of the concepts that was uh, brought into it with ideas like porous pavement, um, but didn't quite make it to the end. So talk about your process that you had to go through that. Yeah, I just want to start by saying, um, you know, great job Val uh, for setting this all up with the, uh, the design and the discussion. And, um, you know, we I've been very excited to be a part of this whole process and the project now. Uh, our process, you know, as with any design problem, it's about de defining your problem. What are the challenges you're really trying to solve? And for us, there were, uh, out of the list that Val had provided, we really could bake it down to about three, um, three key challenges. And the first would be maximizing the drainage credit. The second would be improving site circulation and making sure that the way we're leaving the site is for the optimal functionality of the space. And, uh, and that's for both vehicles and people. Um, and then number three, it was really about creating a demonstration project. And what that's really about is uh, something that would be inspiring, that would be educational, and would really promote advocacy for um, designs that uh, we believe in. And when I say we, I'm saying uh, not just myself with my team at Smith Group, but also Bell and Sacred Heart Church um, and the presenters here as well. So uh, if, if you don't mind, I actually have a couple of slides. Um, Andrea, if you could just bring them up real quick, just to kind of help explain a little bit more about the process. Uh, when I'm talking about maximizing the drainage credit, you know, there, there's really this, the, the way we approached it is really understanding the system that DWC has in place for uh, managing uh, or optimizing those credits, maximizing them. And um, it's really based on three components. The first is uh, maximizing the area of uh, the impervious surface area that is managed. The second is um, really trying to maximize the volume of retent of storm water that is retained, or another way to say it is reducing the amount of water that enters the sewer system. And, um, and then the third is the water that does enter the sewer system, it's slowing down the rate so that uh, it's uh, as much as possible can be infiltrated on site. Um, when looking at our site, you can see there is a lot of uh, impervious surface areas and th there's, there's a lot of existing um, program elements on the site, but really it's about 
looking at it from um, a standpoint of trying to really depave or to remove pavement. So if we want to maximize the drainage credit right off the bat, if we can reduce um, impervious surface areas, uh, that that automatically gives you a drainage credit at, at what would be a rate of 100%. And so when we looked at the site, we started out with a very simple site analysis. And these are some very simple diagrams to really try to explain what uh, the impervious surfaces are on the site. You can see that there is a lot. Uh, this is um, there's about 2.1 acres of impervious uh, area over a site of about 2.88 acres. And what we did, it, it after looking at deep paving, it's really about trying to maximize, or I'm trying to manage the stormwater from the largest contiguous areas. So what you'll see right off the bat is we've got these large uh, parking lots that um, really were functioning as two parking lots and there were two parking areas. Uh, this one over here was parking area one, and then down here we were calling parking area two. And then from there we were looking at, okay, what else can we manage on site? And can we grab the stormwater from the buildings and try to manage that? Well, the this activities building, we were not able to get it as a flat topped roof. Um, it was actually showing some stress fractures uh, on the foundation up the sides of the wall. So we intentionally stayed away from that building. But then we looked at what we could grab on uh, the church up here in the north and then uh, the parlor building, um, which is for some church activities. And these, these roofs are sloped. So what we then did is we grabbed the slopes that were uh, close to the parking lots and we we're able to take that stormwater and direct it to the site. So when we're looking at our process, that, that, that's really a lot of what it is, is trying to maximize those areas and bring it all into a centralized spot. The other thing would then be um, looking at swapping green space. So there was, uh, actually if I go back to uh, the existing, you'll, what you'll see is there's this peninsula that was sticking out. Now, when we're looking to not only improve the functionality of the parking lot, we're looking to also steal that green space and move it into the bioswales areas where it could serve and be much more functional for uh, the goals of the project. Um, what you'll see then as far, as far as our circulation is by removing that, we've got one-way circulation that moves around the parking lot and um, that has really allowed us to maximize the amount of green space we have uh, within the site. And the third thing was really, you know, what, what we had mentioned is the demonstration project and coming up with something that would be a, a creative and fun design, something that uh, would be interesting. And if you recall some of the initial iterations that we had provided from a concept design standpoint, those are really about looking at it from a functional engineering standpoint and we needed to take it to the next level of applying a design. And when we were challenged uh, by Nature Conservancy, when they were ready to move on to the next level, uh, I think Val could share that, you know, I, I've already had this design kind of baked up a little bit in my head. We just didn't get it to paper. She had asked for uh, what we were thinking for the design. And I think we just sketched something up real quick on a napkin in the meeting and she was like, all thumbs up, ready to go. Um, so I think for our design process, that, that really kind of hopefully break, uh, breaks it down for the group. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you, Andy. Andy, Patrick, can I just chime in and ask if it's fair to say in wrap up to what Andy just said, uh, the takeaway is just sketch your design on a napkin and uh, that's really how you <laughs> You're just making sure others got that. Thank you. Many a great idea starts out that way for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so our next question we're going to move to um, uh, is going to get into some of the things that were touched on, um, certainly in, in Val's presentation. Uh, but before we get to the question, I think it's, it's very uh, much worth acknowledging how important having a champion um, on your client slash owner side is, um, especially on some of these, these you know, as, as we were kind of discussing a few minutes ago, um, some of these projects being more uh, pilot in nature or uh, demonstration projects, 
um, that Im implies to some extent that there's going to be a little bit of, of learning along the way um, in the hopes that from those learning learned uh, examples, uh, we can create better infrastructure in the future and more successful implementations. So lessons learned has always been an important part of GSI as we've seen it evolve over the last 15 to 20 years. Um, and these projects are no different from that. There's a few lessons learned um, that we've seen. So uh, Patrick, I'll start with you uh, at, the at the Charles Wright project. Uh, which uh, are some examples of, of some of those struggles, but also some of the wins that you had through your, your process? Yeah. Um, I think the timeline was definitely one of those things. Uh, because since I was brought in midstream and uh, the time in which it took to kind of relearn what was uh, already taking place and just being able to start to think about um, what we were going to do, it was closing in on, uh, you know, late fall, in which case um, it was also a couple of large events that were going to take place at the, uh, at the right. So we really had to struggle to... Um, finalize the design, get sign off by the community as well as the executive staff and uh, uh, people over at the right and be able to hit the ground running right off. One of the hiccups though that uh, uh, came about is with the type of paver that was uh, specified actually requires a minimum of uh, 5,000 square feet, um, in which case this is less than 1,000. And so we had to start to think about where we're going to logistically get pavers um, that weren't going to be made specifically for this project, but actually get into um, something about looking for overruns or seconds working closely with the uh, sales rep. And in this instance, we were able to identify um, pavers out of the Chicago area as well as uh, out of the New York area that were less than... Um, the uh, 5,000 square foot requirement for a single run. And so therefore they were able to ship them to the, the Brighton, Michigan uh, yard. And actually it was a, a less of a cost because they were overruns and the uh, manufacturer really didn't want these in the yard. So we were able to save some money um, in that instance. And as far as, uh, you know, some of the uh, successes is, uh, it happened to be that these small runs were overruns were actually the colors we were looking for. So we would have the strong contrasting colors to create the uh, Sankofa sign uh, to be able to uh, really bring it together. Some of the other uh, design challenges is just education and with the uh, maintenance staff and really understanding what it's going to take and the efforts that it's going to be to be able to maintain uh, the pavers for the life and durability um, of, uh, of the material itself. Um, and so it was one of those things that uh, even though it was a small project, uh, there wasn't as many big challenges as uh, something that uh, was a much bigger, uh, much bigger projects that we've uh, dealt with uh, previous. Great. And I, I just wanted to chime in too, that um, I really appreciate Patrick um, an ECT because we went through, well, everyone involved in this project, we went through three different CEOs at the time that this project was going on. And just to get the support and to start, um, you know, being able to understand what has been done and all the conversations. Um, I, I'm just really glad that I, there were tools available to me and, even being able to have someone from Wayne State University's TRUST program to just help us be able to document, just document a lot of the, the information and the process and the programming. Um, yeah, Patrick definitely was able to kind of jump in at design development level and really hear what the community and what our museum wanted to build. And I think I mean, I think that's definitely an innovation too, is that Patrick was able to really be able to pause and collect all these number of stories and just weave them together into this plan, into a deliverable that really helped us be able to understand where we're going, how we're trying to um, bring in biophilia and really help us, like Patrick is always talking about how the loved, 
what was your quote, Patrick, about loving? Uh, what What is beautiful is loved, and what is loved is beautiful. And and that's really helping us to to name things around the around the our our new initiatives and to care for things and to maintain them. Yeah, and Leslie didn't uh, tell me about the transitions that were going on in the uh, in the staff, so I kept less stress off of me, but uh, she absorbed it all. You come into all the meetings with me, <laughs> like, <laughs> but you were right there by my side, and I think that's to Patrick Durst's point, like having a a champion and having um, a consultant that is kind of by your side as you're navigating all of all of this space and. I think that, um, I mean, my my parents have an architecture firm and um, really knowing that like, there are more things that I think myself as a client, as a business, as an owner's rep would hire. Um, I would I would hope architects and landscape architects and engineers would, would even um, expand their services to be more of a person that could help with um, lifting these these larger things. I think storytelling is a huge component of that, even pulling together these types of presentations to talk about it. Like I would definitely um, hire, hire more help to just lift some of this really heavy stuff. <laughs> That's a great point, Leslie. I think um, sharing of these types of stories um, not only the nuts and bolts of how something gets built in the field, but um, how you navigate a project um, through things like funding. Um, there's so many different um, grants available. Now, a lot of times it takes lead time to have those in place. Um, but if you're if you're being honest about costs up front and, and what it will, will look like, um, there's so many opportunities out there that the design professionals and design communities dialed into that can kind of open up some of these opportunities. And I think one of the lessons learned through these talks is you're having those conversations about what you want for GSI and um, and just providing that space for that conversation to happen because these ideas can can come about on a napkin and, and all of a sudden you've got a great, great project. Um, so um, in, uh, in Andy's slide, um, I saw, I'm sorry, actually Valerie's slide, I saw the, uh, the snow cover in November. And so a lot in the uh, the stormwater realm, um, you know, no dates, they know August 11, 2014. Uh, I think that was like November 11th, 2018. I think it was when that, that uh, random snowfall happened uh, in November, because I know I was trying to pave something in November and all of a sudden we got snow on the ground. Um, Andy, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the, um, the construction uh, portion of your project and, and some of the lessons learned through that? Yeah, sure. The, um, yeah, it, it was interesting definitely because from a scheduling standpoint, because um, when we were going through the design process, we were already having conversations with the Nature Conservancy and the church about project schedule and timeline and, um, at first there was a thought process that this could all be done in one phase where they could shut down the entire parking lot and um, contractor could get in and get out probably in about like an eight, eight to 10 week time frame. Um, and then when we were getting ready to actually bid it, the church actually clarified that they needed to be using at least one part of the lot. And so uh, we had a shift to expand the schedule to about 15 weeks uh, just so that they could um, make use of at least a portion of the parking lot during construction. And so, uh, you know, that played a role, definitely. There's other, you know, a couple other weather delays, things that you try to account for. Um, but then when you get into the actual process, uh, you know, something that we say um, in the, well, I've spoken to a lot of con uh, designers, folks in the construction industry, is that we say, you know, design isn't done until construction is complete. And, you know, we, we would wish that it could really be done, but sometimes, you know, you really just know that you got to get out into the field. You try to put a lot of notes on the drawings to make things clear. Um, I would say, you know, one of the big successes we had was actually having continual communication throughout the entire process. Even when we, you know, almost doubled the duration of the construction timeline, 
we had adjusted uh, our budgets and we worked with the Nature Conservancy to account for progress meetings. And um, and then when we were out in the field, you know, we were trying to work with the contractor uh, to overcome issues. You know, sometimes uh, some of them were more minor things, but uh, I would say that you know retrofits are challenging because you're trying to uh, tie into existing infrastructure, and you can get some data, but da collecting data costs money. So. Uh, we did get a lot of information regarding um, tying into the sewers, but when it came to tying into the pavement, we knew that the art lot itself was, uh, the asphalt was failing, but the funding that the project had, and I'll let Val speak to this more, but it was targeted specifically to go in towards stormwater management, and there really wasn't the available funds to resurface the entire lot. So trying to match uh, existing grade around a parking lot, you know, Val pointed out some challenges there. Some water was getting caught in different places and we had to go back in and do a little bit of extra patching at the end. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, the the contingencies, you know, that Val had talked about too, it's, uh, you know, if anybody watches home improvement shows, I think they always hit on the fact, I find it very amusing. My wife really likes the show Fixer Upper and um, <laughs> every, every episode, you know, there's always at least one thing where they got to call up the the homeowner and say, oh, you know, we ran into this issue and uh, it's going to cost you another little bit of money. And I think that they do that very deliberately just to give folks a little bit of an idea that uh, when you're doing any sort of uh, demolition and excavation, there's only so much that you can really see uh, and anticipate for. And that once again, you know, you try to account for it with notes, just that, like we did with the electrical for the power lines. We knew there were power lines to the utility pole or to the light poles. We had no idea where they were. And they ended up being in the last places we could have imagined. <laughs> I mean, they, they didn't make any sort of a straight shot. And that had a lot to do with the fact that where this parking lot exists used to be an alley. So once again, if you, you're thinking about retrofits working in an urban environment, you're going through an alley. There were some, uh, there was a, an, an abandoned gas line that we had to deal with. So uh, you know, once again, you you really try to do as much as you can, but I would definitely say any sort of lesson learned is uh, communication, just communication and as much as possible um, and uh, just in, in professionalism as well. And I, I have to say that, you know, um, the contractor that we had uh, was absolutely fabulous. And I just really think that you know, it can really make a difference when it comes to the project, the willingness to communicate and the willingness to respond. Um, you know, the fact that they can call me up and we can deal with issues. Uh, I think that really helps. So, um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. There's, you know, other things we get into. Val, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Um, so, I think you touched on most of it and there's so many nuts and bolts and we could drill down. I see that there's a question um, about community engagement aspects. So I'll just respond um, in the case of, you know, the Sacred Heart Church project. One of the things that we did, as Andy said, you know, the timeline did shift. Eight weeks was the original and it doubled to nearly 16. It's a big deal because that changes. I mean, when we're dealing with natural infrastructure, there's so much more you have to think about with plants, plants that are available. They're not available. They're going to die. They're going to live. You've got warranties on the plants. Is, you know, is that warranty going to be expired? It, there's a complexity to shifting and using nature or biophilic material as part of engineering. And yet all of these, um, hopefully Patrick, can at some point touch on the significance of what these projects are bringing. Uh, Patrick Droz, I think you mentioned it before, you know, the significance of these projects in, in helping weave more learnings into the fabric of how engineering design is done over the last couple of decades. Um, to Andy's point, we did meet though every week. So while we originally scheduled eight visits every week with the contractor, with the designer, with myself, and with members of the church community that are on staff for maintenance, as well as um, uh, another member of my team, Candace Calloway, who was 
vigilant about sending emails every week to the church, to parishioners, to give them updates, to make sure that they knew what was going on. Because every week they wanted to get to church and they dealt with 15 weeks of construction. Then, you know, as much as they like the parking lot project, we needed to make sure they loved the parking lot project because it really, they love church more than that. So, you know, making sure that we, I think the, the question about community engagement is that um, I feel really lucky that we were able to support the project in the way we were and engage in the way we were. I think that needs to be recognized that it it was not an insignificant amount of time um, just in communicating all of the details of what was happening during the construction process before, during the design and explaining what was happening after. That, that took up a, a large amount of time, written and in person. It, it really sounds like in both projects, the time and energy spent on the front end uh, of engagement, of hearing ideas, it really set uh, a level of understanding that you guys were able to uh, you know, leverage as things came up during construction. And as long as that communication was still there, that trust had already been built. So it, uh, that always helps for sure, because the unknown is to be expected for sure with anything underground, especially in the city. Um, Okay, so uh, with that, we're, we're getting to question three. Um, and I think we covered uh, some of the questions that are coming in on, on uh, Facebook as well. Uh, we're slated to wrap up at four. Um, so we should have plenty of time. If people still have questions, feel free to present those and we'll either weave them into this conversation or hold them to the end. Um, so with green infrastructure, you know, we always, we always talk about how it has tremendous benefits to um, first and foremost our environment with regard to removing um, stormwater from uh, our combined sewer systems in, in urban areas. Um, and then the remainder of the social benefits and also for our, our environment as well. Um, and those are many times immediate, but then there's also uh, the opportunity for as our plants grow and the root systems become more and more vigorous, that we can enhance the performance of those. And so maintenance after the fact is important. Um, and maybe I'll start with the owners on this um, and now I'll go back to you. Um, maintenance, how is that being uh, handled with, with the Sacred Heart Church? Oh, Val, you're on mute. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, the Nature Conservancy um, at the outset of this project committed to the church to provide maintenance for the first three years. So in a former lifetime, I was sitting on the other side um, alongside our, our consultant designers. Um, so having had that kind of hat coming into this position, I knew um, how important it was to, to make sure that we did encourage and ensure that those plants take hold over that first three year period. Um, in addition to that, though, we are planning to incorporate the um, some workshops for maintenance with the parishioners. So actually, Sacred Heart um, created a garden club as a result of this project, which is really cool. So they're they're not just doing gardening in the bioswell. In fact, the warranty doesn't really let them do any gardening in the bioswale right now, which was when we realized that. But um, it is bringing out all of the parishioners who love nature and want to help with beautification of the grounds. And so what we're doing over time is actually uh, we worked it out so that we can incorporate some maintenance days as the plants take hold and, and get better established so that it's it, we really are creating stewards um, for the long run so that they don't the church doesn't have to pay for a landscape uh, technician. That's great. So Andy, um, was this something that, that came out during design to your understanding that the church would be able to handle some of this in-house or did you have to uh, still set it up for, you know, if a contractor was to do it in your documents? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Cause uh, I think 
what we try to do uh, at the outset of any project is really to understand um, how it's going to be maintained. It's even more critical for green stormwater infrastructure, which, um, you know, it's, it's not a new technology, but at, at the same time, um, our maintenance installation trends, uh, it's just not the, uh, you can't just call up any contractor to do it. So um, I would say that it, it was definitely some of our early conversations. Um, in fact, some of those initial design iterations, they were very long and linear intentionally because there was an emphasis on snow removal. And so we were like, okay, we'll make this easy for you to maintain, you know, if, uh, you know, if that's a big concern of yours. But as we kept going, you know, this kind of circles back a little bit on the community engagement. Um, the ongoing conversations and really trying to talk through uh, the church what we could really do and try to push them, push ourselves and Nature Conservancy on where we wanted to go. It's okay. Can we introduce a few angles in here? Can we, you know, what does that really do snow removal wise? And um, uh, and then on top of it, you know, we ended up losing a few parking spaces from what was existing, but the church was really on board with it. They saw what the potential was. Um, and that really, a lot of it came down to, you know, as you mentioned, the maintenance, you know, and trying to think about the type of system, the size of the system. Uh, I think for us, there was definitely an engineering component to it, definitely, you know, with our under drains and the storage uh, stone below grade. But uh, the plants, uh, I'm a landscape architect, so it's, you know, really important to make sure that the plants are going to be well taken care of, that we're designing it to manage um, storm water so that these systems are not too dry. So without getting too into the details, even if most folks would like to, but we've got these chimney structures designed so that you could have at least a few inches of the first uh, uh, first storm events to build up to really saturate those soils before it actually overflows and goes down into the below grade storage aggregate. Uh, I would also say that we really uh, tried our best to provide a diverse plant palette while at the same time keeping the number of species at a minimum. So we have uh, a total of nine different plants, technically it'd be eight with, uh, we've got two different echinaceas out there. Um, and it's, it, that, that's, that's, that can be a challenge in an urban environment, but we wanted to make sure that we introduced grasses which provide a lot of structure for the flowering, the forbs that a lot of folks love to see, but then to provide seasonal color display. So right now, if you go out there, you'll see some great foxglove beard tongue in bloom. There's some iris, you know, will be transitioning. We'll be seeing a little bit more uh, of, you know, some of the echinacea, the rudbeckia. There are some other plants out there. I would also say that in addition to going with urban hardy plants, um, we went with some that were somewhat recognizable you know, the echinacea and um, uh, black-eyed Susan. I mean, f folks love to see these. Uh, and we want to make sure that when the church gets out there and they're maintaining them, they can understand what is a weed, a, an undesirable plant, and what we should, you know, in fact, be leaving and letting mature. So thanks. Great. It's uh, well said. And, and uh, I, I know I've seen that in other instances where, um, very much consider you know the, the owner in uh, in those planting plants so that makes a lot of sense um i just want to jump in and say thank you andy for identifying that foxglove beard tongue because i drove past the other day and i was wondering what that beautiful flower was i haven't seen so uh those of you who are listening you should really take a ride um, and take a look at this beautiful project there's some things blooming right now that look great Leslie, uh, you have a, a little bit different uh, type of installation. Maintenance is different for your porous systems. Um, you and uh, and Patrick, you want to comment on how you guys approached it at the right? Sure. Um, well, Patrick definitely made it easy for us to maintain. Um, and I think that's a huge design kind of decision to help make sure that there's the right materials and the right sort of spaces. We also worked closely with the Michigan Science Center to install a bioswale over at the Science Center at the same time. And I know um, there are volunteer managers working with the Master Gardeners program to help 
get credit for people. So I think at a museum setting, it's this idea of how do we really em embolden these educational opportunities as a true educational uh, cultural institution space. Um, and, and to kind of tap back into Jen Young's question about community engagement, um, uh, my, I suppose my background um, doing design UX research of being able to ask people how do you how do you use and what do you need and what are people's approaches to software um, it was sort of this idea can that be translated into the built environment and um, and so that was a lot of the kind of work that we were working on was being able to um, ask the questions figure out how to analyze the answers um, find patterns and then be able to translate that into a more technical um, design language of, of values and systems. Um, so that's what we were doing. And, and it's really exciting because the, the Wright Museum has gotten a, a three-year um, IMLS, the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences um, grant on evaluation. So we've been working with an evaluator, Kate, Kate, um, to be able to have all of our staff be trained in evaluation so we can start to understand when people come into the museum, what are they expecting, what is working for them, what's not working for them. And I think um, part of the this process is to figure out how do we um, uplift the values and mission of the museum. And I think what's really interesting is in this whole process of trying to figure out what we are doing, I feel like the learnings we've done of, um, of finding that there is such a deep experience with African-Americans and living in Detroit with 85% um, with African-Americans, like these learnings, these stories can be applied to all green stormwater infrastructure across the city. And wouldn't that be so exciting to, have these stories around the whole city that start to tie together about, you know, what water means to people um, it, throughout rituals, throughout spirituality, the positives, the negatives, and just express that. I think that's one really exciting thing that I've really enjoyed working at a museum is the kind of experiential and all the kind of five systems of of learning, of learning through all of our senses of touch, taste, smell, feel. And it's sort of like, can that be embedded into all the green stormwater infrastructures that are being designed and built? And I think we're kind of trying to figure out how does that happen um, at the rate. Yeah, and let me follow up with a couple of comments real quick as well. And it's uh, something that um, Valerie, Andy, and Leslie also touched on specific to maintenance um, and other aspects of the uh, the plant material. Um, even though I was just involved with the uh, permeable pavement uh, out at Warren Circle, but also having experience for nearly 30 years, if you can believe it, on um, green stormwater infrastructure, even before it was even coined a term. Um, but that is, you know, getting to Valerie when a couple of comments she had made, and it's something that I begin to separate separate out and also start to think about is when you start to think about the design process, bring in the facilities managers or the maintenance people from the very beginning to help you design because they know best of that site and what their behaviors as to, you know, how they remove the snow, where the snow is moved to, that's information that the engineer and landscape architect needs to know. And I also separate out maintenance into two categories. That is maintenance and stewardship. And Valerie had touched on stewardship. When you start to think about stewardship, that gets people more engaged with the activity of the rain garden or the biosoil specific to the plant material. As far as maintenance, to me, that's more like sweeping, cleaning, you know, picking up things, just removing the sediment, something that, you know, the, DW, uh, the uh, maintenance crews uh, with the city or a municipality are able to accommodate and design so that you design to their equipment. Um, you know, whether it's a lawnmower with a 72 inch deck or a 60 inch deck for the buffer around a rain garden or whatever it might be for their sediment removal. Um, that gets a whole different uh, type of practices that are going on. 
And as far as plant material, there's a couple of things real quick to think about from that standpoint is don't be afraid to use native cultivars. They don't have to be native species. Um, because the problem is, is that there isn't that many native nurseries out there growing specifically native plants. So allowing somebody to go to their Home Depot or their Lowe's or their local nursery and look at an echinacea, you know, that is the brilliant purple flower, you know, it could still be echinacea purpurea, but spectacular large blossom or whatever it might be. Um, because we just don't have the time to start thinking about you know, we have to move forward in order to accomplish the amount of green stormwater infrastructure we have to install in these uh, facilities. And we shouldn't be debating strictly native or uh, native cultivars, go with it. Um, and then also in the last point is a lot of, uh, as Andy had pointed out, keeping the diversity down. Um, because if you are using natives, the type of crap and corruption we throw into these bioswales and these rain gardens. There's not very many plants that really have the gen genetic DNA in them to adapt to those conditions. You know, the hotter temperature water that's coming off the parking lot that goes into the bioswale or the sediment or the pollutants that are also associated with that runoff. Many of those plants, native plants, just don't tolerate those systems or even the fluctuation that starts to happen because we're inundating a lot of this, uh, these systems with much more water and hydrology than they were able ever to adapt to or experience. We always historically had these nice little fluctuations of rising and falling, but now all of a sudden we've got these huge, just tremendous downpours that are happening. And so how do you adapt to that um, with the plant material and still have success after five, 10, 15 years but still having a beautiful rain garden, a beautiful bioswell, and everybody continues to be happy and connected to nature in those urban areas. That's great insight from everybody. I think uh, when I saw this question, I had a few generic responses in my mind, but I think everybody's perspective um, blew me out of the water on that. Uh, I would offer as well that, um, you know, it sounds like much like that conversation with the owners about, you know, what they can handle with the facilities folks. Um, know that as, as designers getting into GSI uh, selection for sites, um, to Patrick's point about storms being uh, more intense, higher uh, amounts of rain volume produced, um, most municipalities in the area are reflecting that now with their design manuals to accommodate that. Um, and we also, um, have a, a number of different options uh, for GSI. So it's not just a bioswale. There's all sorts of different options that uh, can be a little more reflective of what an individual owner may want. Um, so just because you're at a site where you, you would not expect GSI, it's still worth asking the question because there may be a solution um, and consulting your local county or city's uh, design guidance would be a good way to, to vet those out before you write them off completely. Um, so we've got about 13 minutes left. Um, and the last three questions that I have, um, I think we can potentially work to kind of add those together and, and boil it down a little bit. So, um, and I'm just going to go read through the questions and I'm going to frame it to our, uh, our folks to kind of talk through. Um, the first question is, what are the expectations of the client and consultant? And this is a little bit of the relationship. Uh, and any assumptions that go into that. The next question is, why does your firm choose to take on projects like these? And the last question is, how do you approach risk? So these three questions really get into some of the professional relationship between design firms and owners and the process by which practices are designed. How does um, a firm approach that particular uh, RFP that comes out from a client? How do they uh, associate that risk into pricing that type of work out? Um, and how do they approach that through the design process? A brief comment about risk. Um, it's usually not something that people like to talk about because it can be uncomfortable, but with any construction project comes risk. And that risk starts here and it gets slowly tapered down until the end of construction and it stays open until you're really sure it's complete. Like Andy was saying that 
uh, design really just keeps going through that whole process and so does risk. Um, relative to, to risk, some of the things that we think about from the consultant side and even the owner side too, is what's that uncertainty? Um, what are we gonna encounter when we do design? What are we gonna encounter in the field? Um, what if the contractor selected is not necessarily the one that we would prefer? Um, and that sometimes happens in low bid situations. How do we manage that? What if we can't be present throughout construction? Uh, and then there's also the, the real risk um, of if something doesn't work. Uh, is it uh, a situation where the design firm has to buy something, it have, have to pay to be part of the solution? Uh, you know, is it the insurance taking that? So those are all things that, uh, especially when we talk about GSI as a technology and innovative uh, experience for designers, um, that does translate to risk. So um, the good news is, is that Patrick talked about how GSI is, it's, it's newer technology, but it's been under development for a long time. Um, and I'll have to get what it was called before it was called GSI, Patrick, because um, I'm, I'm curious to know that just for, for my own information. Um, but the good news is, is that the design community is caught up with with a lot of these best practices and put them in the manuals uh, where there's essentially now a standard of care that we can point to for how does projects are designed, both in uh, the nuts and bolts of how they're built, but also the design for that too. So um, with that, um, maybe we can talk a little bit about that relationship between the client and the owner. And uh, Valerie, maybe I'll start with you um, to kind of talk through uh, how that was, because it sounds like you guys had a lot of iterations and and really got to an optimized design. And I'd like you to maybe talk about that process. Sure. Um, I also, I just want to give a shout out to Patrick Judd, because Patrick is actually one of my professional mentors. And so just thinking about this question, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say something. I mean, it was yeah. like 15 years ago that as an early career engineer, I went to a talk where Patrick was as a consultant at a different firm. And he was just talking about, you know, the need to think differently about how we manage stormwater. And as he was giving his version of nuts and bolts, my mind was blown in, in ways that just really inspired me. So I just want to I just want to say thank you. And I, I'm honored to be on this panel, but also to, to be here now with Patrick so many years later. Um, and I think it speaks to the expectations though. I, I was just thinking about it because the expectation in my mind, I since then have continued to hold Patrick's views as the right views or the views that I want to be associated with. So if I'm working for someone or with someone, that's that's the expectation that that anyone I'm going to work with would hold those same kind of tenets and beliefs and push a project and be willing to take risks, because these these are new but they're also really important. Um, so I think in our case, I was really lucky um, to work with Andy and and Smith Group and his team because I think Andy too holds a lot of those same views, um, and so it it really was a lot of back and forth. I think we had a really great, honest, open relationship and um, very much appreciated, you know, the diligence that that Andy brought and the detail oriented nature. And I think sometimes I made him crazy because I, I think Leslie and I have opposite ends. I know too much. Um, so that can also be a danger. I think when you're in this space now and as a client, um, I'm on the other side. And so the expectation poor Andy and Smith group had to maybe pull me down a little bit toward reality of what we actually have money and time for. Um, but, but I think it was, a uh, it was a really good back and forth. Um, Gosh, Andy, I am going to hand it over to you. I'm curious uh, to hear what, Anything? How did how did we and this experience differ from other clients? Um, well, there's definitely a continuum of clients with an understanding of the design process, and I think that uh, there's also the um, 
I think that, you know, it worked out really well, like you said, with our open communication. I think that, you know, um, thankfully you and I were uh, acquaintances before the project. So I think that really helped when, you know, we could just have some very frank conversations about um, certain things, especially the fee uh, for the budget more is what I'm trying to say, the budget for construction, what we're trying to do. And then, you know, the, the know that, just knowing that the goals of the project um, uh, was really about maximizing the drainage credit. Um, you know, I think we, we tried to make sure that we could do everything we could to get where, where we needed to go. And, um, and yeah, it worked out really well with having the open communication. Something I would just probably add to the conversation here is that when we're talking about clients and being on a continuum of understanding the design process or understanding um, project implementation is, you know, there's, it, it's really about being very clear about expectations for whomever you are. And so expectations can show up from uh, the RFP you know, the RFP communicates a certain set of expectations, but more than anything, um, it's really about when you're able to, I guess, before you get to the RFP, as much as you can learn is, is great. So if the clients are able to help communicate certain things about their mission, I think understanding that TNC had a larger mission, that was really important. Um, that was also a factor, Patrick, when it came to talking about risk and understanding what, you know, what we want to be investing our time in. It's investing time into organizations that really have this bigger holistic mission into uh, conservation. And then, um, but also I wanted to really just mention the importance of, you know, a kickoff meeting. And when you, when you get to a kickoff meeting, People think, yeah, you, you know, we've got some understanding. We won the project. These are the client's goals. This is what we want to get into. This is the, the budget. Well, the kickoff meeting really is just, it, it really should be set around really establishing those goals and making sure everybody's on the exact same page where we want to go. And I think that that, for our project and specifically, I think that really helped. I think we sat down, we really talked about what the priorities were. And then I think we were able to have that frank conversation from day one. Well, at some point here, we're probably going to be reaching some, uh, you know, where we're going to have some conflict. We need to know what are your, your top priorities so that we can start to evaluate what decisions we should be moving or what, what parts of the design elements should be making, uh, uh, should continue on. One thing I just want to add, sorry, real quick, and I know we got short on time, but the uh, clients love to see and we love as a designer i love to see things um interventions at the surface right for stormwater we want to see these really cool aesthetic runnels we want to see things water moving from the roofs down to these basins and then moving through the site well when it came down to it while we really wanted those in the design they ended up not making the cut because the cost for those relative to the amount of uh, uh, the drainage credit that we would get was extraordinarily minimal. You know, you you can design some of them to help manage your stormwater, but the conveyance mechanisms themselves don't necessarily uh, translate into the management. So, sorry, I just wanted to end with that. Thanks, Patrick. Great insight. Uh, so we got two minutes left. Um, Leslie and Patrick, if you guys want to speak on that. Um, briefly. Yeah, let me real quick. And as a, as a consultant, and that is, you know, just as Andy had said, even prior to the kickoff meeting is really understand who your client is and how much knowledge and understanding they have in the, in this process. Um, you know, it's a situation where in Leslie's instance, you know, I became more of a teacher and I, felt comfortable with that. And I think it's important that we engage ourselves in that position as a teacher and, you know, being able to um, inform, you know, the step by step by step process. And, you know, somebody like Val, who has a lot of experiences, it makes it a little easier for us. But I think at the same time, it's also not never assuming because she knows a lot that she knows a lot or knows everything. And so, it's just being able to have a lot of interactive dialogue back and forth, back and forth, and just 
that conversation um, on a continual basis. And so never make assumptions about anybody in any of your clients. Yeah, I think um, I, I like how Val sort of opened this up with just like, you know, what are the expectations and what are your values? And I know that that was one of actually our icebreaker questions <laughs> that um, it was just sort of like, what values do we all bring to these projects? And I think that's what drives these projects to be successful is when we share these values. And I, I think having Patrick just being able to be so open to listening and just helping to nudge things at the right time um, has, has been really, really helpful to just move this project to what it needs to be. Um, it's, it's, I suppose it's a journey to do any project and um, especially construction, design and construction when things get so complicated. I mean, we found a whole um, building underneath underneath our porous pavers project that we needed to then dig out and um, have two two loads of, of, um, of, of debris taken away. Um, so it's just sort of like trying to find these partners that can help support um, as we as we move through this together. And and then things are constantly changing. I don't think the conversations of even doing sustainability in a museum was sort of a, not a normal a normal approach for cultural institutions. And so um, as people are beginning to see like, wow, this is this is something like you can actually empower people to have actions on energy, water, and waste um, as they come visit the museum because we're beginning to tie in history and nature and curiosity that I think, um, yeah, there's just like the world is sort of our oyster to be able to rethink these relationships. So I'm gonna, um, I, it doesn't look like there are any other questions from uh, the live audience. And we are just a little bit over time. So I just want to close it out by thanking everyone um, who, would, who stuck with us and listened to this. And I want to thank our panelists again. And if we were live, I would say, let's give them a round of applause. But we will just all think that in our heads. Um, and just, um, I guess I'm not going to really make a lot of concluding remarks because we're short on time. But I think one of the points about really needing champions for these projects um, we have great champions on this panel. I hope we now have great champions in the audience. These projects don't always make single bottom line financial sense. We're working towards that. We're really trying to get it so that the, uh, that the return on investment, um, when you look at the drainage credit, works. Um, we know there's ordinances now that are requiring this, but they don't always require above ground beautiful projects. Uh, DWSD is, is, seems just as happy with below ground projects that you can't see. Um, I, think, I think Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb County are working on an ordinance that does focus on infiltration and encourage that. But anyways, all that said that um, this is still kind of evolving new work. You can hear it's not that easy, but it's incredibly beautiful. Great way to bring people together around nature, bring nature into their lives. We've seen during COVID how important that is. Um, that people get out and experience nature. And I want to encourage all of you to go look at these great projects. Go look at them time and again. I, the, the Pavers project will probably always look about the same, but the campus that it's um, embedded in is going to continually change. There's a Detroit Square project that's evolving that's going to have green infrastructure throughout that cultural campus. Eastern Market, as Val explained, is going to be evolving, and the city of Detroit and the region is really just getting more and more beautiful. Um, and you all play a really important role in that. So I hope you learned something today and are even more motivated to go out and do this great work. And thank you again, Andrea, Val, Leslie, Patrick, Patrick, Andrew. And follow up with anybody if you have questions. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Yeah.